Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Federal health officials are finding themselves in a familiar position, racing to contain a highly contagious virus without enough vaccine supply to prevent it. The monkeypox outbreak has now infected more than 10,000 Americans in the U.S., with cases reported in every state but Wyoming. New Jersey claims nearly 300 of the positive tests with vaccine clinics reporting high demand for the shots. Well, this week, the FDA authorized monkeypox vaccines for children under 18 and recommended a plan to ration the nation's limited supply as the infection count keeps rising. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has the story. I looked for a couple weeks to get an appointment and everything was booked up. But Evan Cumming finally scored a spot and got a shot for monkeypox here at Bergen Newbridge Medical Center, which today vaccinated 320 folks with their first of two vaccinations. With the disease now declared a U.S. public health emergency and monkeypox vaccine in very short supply, people felt relieved. As a citizen, I wanted to get my vaccine because I know it's important as just for my own health and for the public's health. So I've seen people with monkeypox and I'm like, oh, I definitely don't want that. I don't want to spread it either. Monkeypox is spreading. Jersey's logged 293 cases so far, with most of them concentrated in Hudson County. The CDC reported some 10,400 cases nationwide and scarce vaccines being rationed at the five New Jersey medical facilities giving monkeypox shots, including Cooper University Healthcare, which has received 600 doses total. We are putting those appointments up as soon as we get them and you know it's um just like springsteen tickets they will go very very quickly people are concerned and they want to get the vaccination as soon as possible i think that's a good thing uh, but it just shows you how much more demand there is than available vaccines monkeypox vaccine comes one dose to a vial but to stretch vaccine supplies the fda yesterday issued an emergency use authorization that would permit providers to divide a vial into five individual doses giving each person a one-fifth dose and it would be administered differently. Instead of the current subcutaneous shot that goes deeper into the arm, these shots would go just under the skin, a so-called intradermal injection that requires less vaccine but is almost as effective. We're all ready if they decide to go to that. The nurses and I have been talking about how we will uh, do the training competencies and get them all ready to, uh, to do it. That was one of the ways we learned how to give an injection when I was learning how to do injections. It's something that has been around for a long time. The National Institutes of Health pointed to a 2015 study that showed the one-fifth intradermal dose generated a robust immune response compared to the regular shot. Doctors say the skin's upper layer contains numerous immunity cells. By injecting it directly under the skin instead of into the fat underneath it, the idea is that you're going to get a much stronger immune response, and that's really the point of any vaccination. The challenge is making sure people understand that if we do go to that smaller dose with the different route, it is going to be just as effective as the original doses that we got. We wanted to get it out there to people. We have it, and now we want to make sure that we can get it to as many, many people as we can. New Jersey's Department of Health says it's working with vaccine providers to implement the new recommendations as soon as possible, but vaccine supplies remain a problem. Just do the math. White House officials announced its 440,000 dose stockpile would increase five-fold to 2.2 million doses with the new intradermal vaccination protocol. But the estimated at-risk U.S. population needs 3.2 million doses of the vaccine. 
Jersey health officials in early August said they expected 14,500 doses in coming weeks. We will li most likely hit a cliff at some point because, again, there's such a high demand. And anyone can get this disease from direct contact. People getting vaccinated now will most probably be getting the one-fifth dose for their second shot. I think it's a really cool idea. If it can provide more vaccines for more people, um, I'm open to it, and I think everyone should be open to trying something new and different if it helps keep everyone in this country safe and protected. In Paramus, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. This week, the state Senate met for a special and rare summer session, primarily to confirm six new Superior Court judges. As New Jersey faces a mounting and unprecedented judicial vacancy that many agree has risen to crisis levels. But they didn't address the three unfilled positions remaining on the state Supreme Court. A number of judicial nominees have been submitted by the governor, but are still going through the vetting process, one that's largely steered by Senate Senate President Nick Scutari, who joins me now. Senate President, uh, thanks for joining me and welcome uh, to the show. I want to ask you first about these judicial vacancies. It's been called a crisis, catastrophic. Is the criticism fair uh, that both the governor's office and the legislature aren't moving quickly enough? You've got three vacancies on the Supreme Court, dozens of Superior Court vacancies. Is it fair? Well, I think it fails to come into place the 20 additional judgeships we made just a few years ago. So you're using overall vacancy numbers, but it fails to show that we actually have 20 extra judges on those books that we didn't have just about five years ago. So you have to take 20 judgeships off of the vacancy list in order to make it a fair number that we're looking at if you can compare it from year to year, decade to decade. People say we have a record number of vacancies, but the truth of it is we actually have a record number of judges on the bench. Well, that, uh, that said, one, though, Senator, there are still cases that can't be heard, whether it be divorce, custody battles, domestic violence, violence cases. I mean, you know, you hear it from attorneys all the time. We are as well um, that they say justice can't be accessed. Well, I'm a lawyer also, but I can tell you that as the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee for a dozen years and now the president of the Senate, um, we can only consider nominations that are made. We can't initiate nominations. So we're we're vetting them as quickly as we get them. In fact, we were just in last week to do six new judgeships that we received, some of which we just received last second and we jumped to attention and did, I did two interviews on Sunday of people. So that doesn't mean that we're not moving at a really quick pace. Uh, so we've bent over in order to make sure that people are vetted quickly but we can't we can't get away from an extraordinarily important vetting process because these people get on these benches generally for life you did hold a session uh, a special session to get the ball rolling there but there are still 11 uh, by our count nominees uh, four that were made in may three in june one that dates back to march um, and then another three just from august what's holding them up then you're, 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 you're talking about 11, which is a, not a huge number when you're talking about 60 openings. And additionally, they're, they're, being, they're, they're being vetted, and you're saying June, and it's August. So that's not a long period of time when the front office, the governor's office, takes a year to do their vetting. And we can't be expected to do it at the drop of a dime. But uh, there are a variety of reasons uh, that people are not on the agenda just that yet, but it's not an extraordinary number. And I think it's, uh, you know, we're doing, you, you get, you got a variety of different factors that are, that are slowing the process up. And I think you got to ask the executive branch as well, but I can tell you that our process is moving very, very quickly and we're moving as quick as we can to put people that are qualified on the bench. Is one of those factors, Senator, senatorial courtesy. I looked back, uh, it looks like that was put in place back when we had just one senator representing each county. Now with the redrawing of district lines and such, you can have up to four senators in some cases um, covering any particular county the way that it, it spans now. Is it not time to reform that? Well, sometimes it's more. But I believe that the process that we have in place is an excellent one for screening judges who receive seven year terms and then lifetime tenure regarding positions. They don't have to face the voters. They do have to face the Senate. All right. Senate President Nick Scutari, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks. 
President Biden on Wednesday signed into law one of the most significant expansions to medical benefits for veterans in more than three decades. The PACT Act extends health coverage to veterans who've developed illnesses after being exposed to toxins from burn pits used on U.S. military bases during their service, predominantly in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's expected to help millions of service members and their families who've been suffering. Ted Goldberg reports. The PACT Act becoming law could be life-changing for New Jersey veterans who lived, slept, and ate near these burn pits. I don't think that there was a single member uh, who served in Iraq or Afghanistan if you were on a large base or if you were out doing small uh, unit operations, you you weren't really going to get away from the burn pit exposure. This has always been a crack practice from the military. Burn everything. Maybe they felt that the enemy shouldn't get any of our materials, burn all the evidence in a sense, and just carried on years after. There was no thought about the repercussions from doing this to our soldiers. The act allocates around $400 billion to help service members still ailing after exposure to toxic substances. I uh, was diagnosed with asthma shortly after, and now that this will give me an opportunity to get the help that I need to, you know, get compensated for all those years. The way I feel and the way I wake up every day, it's draining, right? You got to get up, you got to clear your sinuses. Um, now there's an opportunity and a chance. Chris Tessine hopes the new law can help finally fix the VA, a big source of frustration for him and other veterans. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many people have tried to get help. When I went into VA the first time, I was discouraged. Both my claims were denied initially uh, and had to be uh, resubmitted. Vietnam veterans, like Mike Warner, will get benefits as well. He served before becoming the Deputy Commissioner for Veterans Affairs in New Jersey. As a result of Agent Orange, I had prostate cancer. And then I, uh, after that, I, I had... Uh, Bladder cancer. Prior to the law's passage, veterans exposed to burn pits had to apply for the burn pit registry, which denied about 70% of applicants. Under the PACT Act, veterans just have to show that they served near a burn pit. Your burden of proof is much lower. Prior to this, you had to prove that you were there, that the burn pits caused um, the condition you have. Ken Hageman is the state adjutant for VFW of New Jersey. He's excited to see more veterans finally get what they deserve. It'll affect millions of veterans. It's the biggest, it's the largest impact uh, we'll have in our lifetime for veteran health care. The benefit of the doubt is being given, and it's not just this run through the bureaucratic gauntlet of the VA to prove yourself worthy of the care that you earned. Hopefully the VA will move as quickly as the president and the advocates would like to see them move. Let's believe in this. Let's stay together um, and try to make sure that VA and everybody else upholds what's now been passed into law for us. Even veterans' families and caregivers are eligible to apply for PACT Act benefits, showing that no man or woman who served this country should ever be left behind. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. Lawmakers from environmental committees in both chambers met along the Jersey Shore today to chip away at proposals to bring more renewable energy to New Jersey and address climate change in a coastal area that's seen its effects firsthand. The committees are gathering input from the public and top state leaders who say the time to act is now. Joanna Gagas reports from Tom's River. We are experiencing the very extremes the scientists told us about. DEP Commissioner Sean LaTourette kicked off a public hearing of the Senate and Assembly Environmental Committees today with a dire reminder about some recent weather events caused by climate change. The sudden floods that struck Bergen County amid pre-drought conditions just last month. The arid conditions that are diminishing crop yield in farm-rich Salem County. The largest wildfire in over a decade that destroyed 15,000 acres of our pinelands just barely two months ago and the nine-mile-long harmful algal bloom 
that is infecting the Millstone River right now and threatening water supplies in central New Jersey. The science is clear that these conditions will only get worse, according to environmentalists who spoke in support of two bills sponsored by the Senate Committee Chair Bob Smith. The first bill would require the state increase renewable energy sources of electricity sold in New Jersey. That bill, if passed, sends a major signal to all of the energy generators in New Jersey that we want to be all renewable or non-carbon, which means nuclear, faster. If we can get the bill passed, by the year 2035, we're going to be 100% renewable or non-carbon. That would be a major step forward in reducing New Jersey's uh, carbon footprint. Environmentalists like Jeff Tittle have been critical of Governor Murphy's energy master plan, saying it included energy sources that were not renewable. Tittle sang a different tune today. This could be one of the best things this legislature has done since passage of the Highlands Act, because this is a kind of landmark legislation that will make a big difference to the state and to our environment. But he'd like the state to push for a faster timeline than the 2045 deadline written into this draft of the bill. Other states have moved to 100% renewable by 2035. I don't know if we can make that goal, but at least try for 2040. Uh, we can set the goal if we come a little short. Well, you know, better to come a little bit short than to not try to hit the goal in the first place. The committee also heard debate over a bill that would divest New Jersey's public employee pension fund from all investments in fossil fuel companies. Continuing to invest in fossil fuels is too great a financial risk for the pension and too great a threat to humanity. It is time to align our investment strategy with our climate needs and our climate goals. Others cautioned the move could bring serious financial harm to the state. Divesting in fossil fuels costs New York State pension system and taxpayers more than $33.4 billion over 30 years and lead to steep tax hikes, service cuts, or slashed pension benefits. The first draft of this bill was proposed in 2018, and it's languished in the legislature since. Smith says, much like New Jersey's recent divestment in Russian companies, this too is possible and important. We need to send a signal to the fossil fuel industry that they've got to find ways to get into the renewable energy business much better than they are right now. Chairman Smith expects to hold at least two more public hearings on these bills before they're ready, at least in the Senate, for a vote this fall. In Tom's River, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, it's all about the unions. Hundreds of nurses voted this week to form the largest health care unionization since the start of the pandemic here in New Jersey. More than 500 registered nurses at Clara Moss Medical Center in Belleville voted to unite in 1199 SEIU United Healthcare Workers East. Well, they're joining a growing movement of frontline caregivers who've been organizing, citing a need for better working conditions and patient care in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. In a mail-in ballot election, nearly 8 in 10 nurses voted in favor of unionization. Workers say they want improved wages and job security, along with changes to staffing levels. 1199 SEIU represents about 450,000 health care workers in the region. It's one of the fastest growing in the country. Meanwhile, workers at another Starbucks location in New Jersey just won the vote to unionize. Baristas at the Church Street store in Montclair voted unanimously to join Starbucks Workers United. That's the international union supporting the movement. In a letter to Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, workers on the organizing committee said the store is understaffed. Workers are improperly trained and they're using equipment that doesn't work. They also alleged workers who complained had their hours cut. The Montclair unit will represent all full-time and regular part-time baristas. Montclair joins more than 186 Starbucks stores nationwide that have joined Workers United since January, including Hopewell, the first Starbucks location in New Jersey to unionize. Unionization efforts and scrutiny of safety practices have intensified for workers at Amazon. In New Jersey, in just over three weeks' time, three Amazon warehouse employees at three separate locations have died. 
The latest was on August 4th at a delivery station facility in Monroe Township. That comes after a worker at the fulfillment center in Carteret died on July 13th in the middle of Prime Day, which is traditionally Amazon's busiest sales week of the year, and was followed by the death of another worker later in July after an accident at the Robbinsville Amazon facility. Well, the deaths spurred outcry from workers and public scrutiny from members of New Jersey's congressional delegation and has triggered a federal investigation. A representative for the Federal Occupational Health and Safety Administration says the results of each investigation may not be available for another six months. Turning now to Wall Street, let's take a look at how the markets closed today. Well, keeping New Jersey farms in business is about as hard a job as ever. Owners are battling rising inflation and labor costs, not to mention the extreme heat. Now two state lawmakers are proposing an out-of-the-box way to boost farms' revenue streams that's got some environmentalists concerned. Raven Santana reports. When you hear the word farm, most people envision this, chickens, cows, and pigs. But lawmakers want you to reimagine this, beautiful, endless views of farmland seen here on Lima Family Farms in Hillsboro. We want to give these owners flexibility. We don't want to open the door. This is not about catering every day of the week. Many times these spaces or structures like this barn remain unused or vacant. That's why Assemblyman Roy Fryman and Senator Paul Sarlo are sponsoring a bill to allow farms located on preserved farmland to host special occasion events like weddings and concerts that they say would provide increased income stability. About a limited amount of events, give them a limited amount of events, um, a limited amount of space that they could use, make sure they do all the proper notifications to the town of where they're going to park the folks, the hours of operation, the noise, the ordinances, um, the portable bathroom facilities, to make sure they're doing it right, to make sure it's getting done right. But nobody is standing in their way and throwing up red tape. And given the rise in fuel prices, supply chain issues, and inflation, owner of Lima Family Farms, John Lima, says he's on board. Lima gave us a tour of the vacant barn that he plans to use for a special event. He says once he clears and empties it, the possibilities are endless. You could put all kinds of nice chairs in here. You can have a nice lounge area, a meeting area for people to come and relax. Lima says the barn that can hold about 300 people can easily be transformed into an event space that he says can bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I think you could do. I think we could do a half million dollars a year. I mean, if I was to put a uh, a small breakfast or lunch in venue here is open all the time, and that may be enough for somebody to cover their debt service on their mortgage. Tony Connett, co-owner of Martinet Farms, located less than a mile away, says to count him in too. Connett says he would convert the vacant space on his farm into an area for poetry and music. There are a lot of risks, seasonal risks that don't happen every year. Sometimes they seem like they're happening more often, but by having another outlet to opportunity to make money would really be helpful for all the farmers. We have done a very very strong job in preserving the farms. There are 9,900 farms in the state of New Jersey. We have about 2,700 right now preserved. That is an amazing deal for the people that live in New Jersey because never can this be developed. But not everyone is in favor of the bill. Amy Hansen is policy manager at New Jersey Conservation Foundation, a nonprofit organization that helps to preserve farmland across Jersey. Hansen says the bill undermines the program's purpose of protecting land from non-agricultural uses. The New Jersey Conservation Foundation has preserved thousands of acres of farmland across the state for decades. And we help create this program, which is paid for by taxpayers. and. Um, we're, we're worried that this actually gives back uh, uh, commercial rights to, to the landowners that were not originally, that was not originally the intention of the program. Meantime, Senator Sarlo says a conditional veto is currently being worked on to change some of the language that might sway Hansen. Sarlo says he's confident that the final changes will be approved and that the bill will pass in September. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana.
Finally tonight, the American Red Cross needs blood donations so badly, the organization is offering to give you free gas for a year. The Red Cross says anyone who donates blood or plasma during the month of August will automatically be entered into a national drawing for a chance to win gas for a year. It's about a $6,000 value. Hospitals across the state are experiencing a blood shortage and are especially looking for platelet donors. Data show blood donations typically drop during summer months, but the pandemic worsened the situation, forcing blood drives to be canceled or postponed. The Red Cross is also giving away $10 e-gift cards to anyone who donates at one of their locations. According to the organization, the majority of Americans are eligible to donate blood, but only about 3% do so. You could change that. And that's our broadcast this evening. Make sure you head over to njspotlightnews.org and check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to keep up with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com. I'm Miles. And this is what I work for, to be my best for them and for me, in body and in mind. I need a health insurer that helps me get the care I need for both, that has mental health professionals that I can talk to when I need to, because when I feel strong and secure, so do they. This is my life, and this is how Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey works for me.